You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash The Options Insider, or via questions at TheOptionsInsider.com. This episode is sponsored by Demand Derivatives, a startup futures exchange and clearinghouse trading the world's major assets in a creative new way. You already trade on an exchange. Here is your chance to own one. Before they approach large strategic partners for funding, the pioneering team at Demand Derivatives launched a crowdfunding portal so that regular traders have the chance to buy shares. Learn more and become a part of this revolutionary fintech project now at demandderivatives.com slash crowdfunding. You wanted it, you got it. A radio program that helps teach you options trading inside and out, basic to complex. This is Options Bootcamp. Whether you want to learn how to protect your portfolio, generate income, or even become a master of volatility, the Options Bootcamp drill instructors will break it all down for you. Now, let's get you into peak options trading shape. Here are your Options Bootcamp drill instructors. All right, everybody. That music can mean only one thing. It is Education Wednesday, time for the premiere Options Education Program. Yes, it is time once again for Options Boot Camp. My name is Mark Longo from the OptionsInsider.com, as well as, of course, from the ever busy. We're just cranking out content all the time over there on the Options Insider Radio Network. So first off, if you're just listening to Boot Camp, man, you are missing out on so many other great shows. The Option Block Volatility Views. Listeners of this show should really also be listening to Options Playbook Radio. A lot of people, if you want a straight-up syllabus of options from A to Z, starting at A, going all the way to Z, with an actual book you can follow along with and actually read along with as you do it, Options Playbook Radio is a great one for you as well. And, of course, wherever you get this content, man, it's available everywhere. I noticed the other day, Dan, we're up there on Audible now as well. It's a little intimidating to see our content up there alongside the greats of literature. But if you want to take a break, from your audiobooks and listen to us for a little bit there. We won't judge. No matter where you get it, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Audible, wherever you get our content, make sure you keep rating and reviewing. It really does help the legion of newcomers to the options world discover our content. Of course, keep those questions and comments coming. They're very important, especially for a day like today where you folks are going to take the reins with a bit of a mail call balooza. And who's going to help me answer all of your options questions why none other than the black-headed one himself, Mr. Dan Passarelli from Market Taker Mentoring, as well as the author of one or two or 47 options-oriented tomes. Mr. B, welcome back to the Options Boot Camp Drill Instructor Proving Ground, sir. Oh, Mark, I am ready to go today, man. This is going to be great. All right, the people are clearly ready to go, too. They got their questions hot and heavy, so let's get to it. A little bit of the old mail call. Mail call. Time to look at questions submitted by our listeners. All right, everybody, welcome to the mail call, the portion of the show where you folks take the reins, your questions, your comments, your insights, your pearls of wisdom. You have so many. They come from all over the world, and they are so many and varied that sometimes it's hard to keep up with them all. There are quite, there are quite a few, <laughs> but we do our able best to make sure you guys get your time here. On the show, and since these are crazy times, let's kick it off as we are wont to do these days. A little bit of love. This comes in the form of a five-star Apple Podcast review from Ray Sisipul. 
So it's a bunch, a whole bunch of letters there, but I think it looks like Ray Sissipal. <laughs> he says, one of the best. That's the subject of his review. He says, top shelf information shared by Mark, Dan, and crew helped me continue to step my game up. I'm subscribed to all of the Options Network podcast. Five out of five. Well, thank you for that, Ray Sissipal. I like the handle there. You too can join Ray Sissipal and everyone else. Wherever you get this content, keep rating and viewing. I've said it before. I'll say it again. It really is important for the new folks out there, and they are legion to discover the show. You old folks have been around for a while. We love all you too, but there's a bunch of new folks discovering options every day. Just look at the numbers from March, the most active options month in the history of the business since the days of the early 70s when the SIBO first was a glimmer in the eye of the Board of Trade there. And March, the busiest month ever. January number two, February number three, December number four. So every month is pretty much a new record. So new people are coming in all the time. They need help. So help them find us and we'll help them in turn. And we'll, of course, give you some love on the show. It's just a mutual love fest here on the show, Dan. What do you think about Ray Sissus Pull here and his five-star love, sir? I love love. Love is, hmm, I feel like I should write a poem. Yeah, we need a little haiku. I'll give you two minutes. I'll come back to you with a little haiku about love. What do you think? (laughs) (laughs) That sounds pretty great. While you're thinking about that, I know a lot of things have been busy over there in the land of MTM. You've been getting deluged nonstop with questions from your mentees since our last show. So percolate one up to the top for us. What's the most interesting, the most compelling question you've received from your mentees over the course of the past week, sir? You know, we've been talking about uh, the complexities of reading volatility charts and volatility charts. um, Once you get them down, they're actually pretty straightforward, but there's a couple of tricky things. One is what I call a volatility mesa. Oh, excuse me. One is what I call a volatility mesa, which is when when the stock one day just happens to have a really big gap in price, like uh, like you see sometimes on earnings, what that does to the historical volatility chart is it causes one big, huge, like spike up day in it. But it's not a spike like you would see with implied volatility, because with historical volatility, it's a calculation that has 20, you know, 20 or 21 or 30 days worth of data in it. So that one big gigantic gap stays in the calculation for, I, I like to calculate it as, as 21 days. And then 21 days later, once that day is no longer the calculation, we see the other side of the MESA and we see uh, the historical volatility fall a whole bunch. So basically like I call it a MESA because it's like, you know, in Arizona where it's like this, you know, just like big cliff up plateau and a big cliff down. And uh, those are important to recognize and understand because they they can really skew your your analysis. You can think, oh, wow, historical volatility is pretty high, but it's just that one like temporary, you know, one off event that really kind of skews the data and throws off the historical volatility number for a while. So um, volatility maces are something to be aware of. I talk about them a lot in my book, Trading Option Greeks. And, um, you know, you should be aware of them and be able to trade off them. And, and, and it'll make you more effective. It'll make you a better option valuer. I like that. That's a good term, the volatility Mesa. So if you're intrigued by that, want to learn more, hit them up over there at Market Taker. Speaking of terms and indeed of Market Takers, this next one is right up your alley here, Mr. Dan. It comes from Alex. He or she just wants to know very simply, what is a Market Taker, sir? Oh, yes. Well, so the Market Maker, which is what Mark and I did for a whole great number of years down on the CBOE trading floor, is some, someone who makes a market, who who lists a bid and an ask. Now, everybody else takes that market or or leaves it or or tries to mill it, but but that's what a market taker is. It's someone who who takes that market and 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 gets really good at it um, because market makers they have an edge in that. Uh, the difference between the bid and the ask is is basically how market makers make their money. That's their edge. So in order for market takers, the rest of us, to 
to, to overcome that edge that we're giving up to the market makers, we need to have certain skills and um, we need to have our own sources of edge. So, yeah, I think it's I think it's kind of a pretty important concept to know where we fit into the trading ecosystem and and how we can use that to our advantage. All right. Well said. Next up, we got Nicholas. Nicholas wants to know. Hello, boot camp crew. Well, hello, Nicholas. Loving all your great education. You've made me a much better trader, and I thank you so much for that. Or here you go with the love fest here again, Dan. He that's to inspire your haiku about love that you're working on diligently. I can see. Uh, he says I've also discovered crypto over the past year. Uh, in parentheses here, thanks in part to your crypto show. Well, we're we're glad we could bring you to the dark side, or perhaps sad. I guess depending on how it's worked out for you, there, Nicholas. Uh, he says my question: Do all of the many option strategies that you've taught us also apply to the world of crypto options? Can I still trade the verticals and butterflies? Thanks again. You guys are the best. Well, I guess there are two answers to this question. Theoretically, yes. All the strategies we teach you all the time, you know, like you mentioned, butterflies, verticals, whatever it is, straddles, uh, calls and puts, dogs and cats living together, they all apply no matter what the underlying is. As long as it's optionable and has options on it, you can do those strategies. Now, practically, it's a different story. You know, most of the time we're talking on this show, you guys are coming at us to ask questions about very deep and liquid names, your Apples, your Amazons, your Spies, your Teslas. You don't really have a problem trading those very effectively, particularly around the front month and the weeklies and the at the monies you guys like to trade. Crypto options, a little bit of a different story. First off, I'm assuming you're in the U.S. I mean, a lot of our listeners are international, but I'm assuming you're in the U.S. And so your options right there, pun intended, are very limited. You have the 5X options at CME, which are extremely expensive. And I mean, Bitcoin's around 50,000. The 5X multiplier on top of that, you see how things get pricey very quick. And they don't do a lot of volume. So you can't really leg into leg out of things. Spreads are pretty wide. Your other alternative, we just had them on the crypto show this week. The other alternative for a little bit more bite-sized contracts are Ledger X. They do a 100th of a Bitcoin contracts. That's a lot more suitable for most people out there from a size perspective. And they're doing decent paper. So it's starting to get more active and come online. But it's the same deal there. If you get in there, you get away. I looked at some of the strikes and and series just this week when we had them on the show. And they had decent OI around front month at the money and a few other strikes around. You get much beyond that. The OI starts to vanish and the spreads start to widen out. So Practically, when you're talking about multi-leg spreads like your flies and things you're talking about here, probably going to get a little bit expensive, a little bit dicey to execute reliably in the world of crypto options here in the U.S. Now, if you're an international listener, I know a lot of you are, you can go to a Deribit or a place like that much deeper, much more liquid. You won't have those same practical concerns. So theoretically, the answer is yes. Practically, given the limited options, pun intended, that are available to most of our U.S. customers, it's not quite there yet. It's a shame because the underlying has gone from sub one dollar to north of sixty thousand over the span of not that long, and yet there haven't really been that many viable options to trade on them. So again, a sad thing for most options traders. Dad, anything you want to add here on the suitability of our strategies here on the show to the crypto options market? Yeah, just one really super important thing. Uh, you know, Mark mentioned liquidity, definitely an important thing, but there's one other thing and that is accountability. Um, just the integrity in the system. Uh, it, you know, if you trade Apple options and it really takes off and you make, you know, $200,000 on your Apple calls, they're, the other person on the other side of that trade is going to deliver if they don't, his, his broker will or their clearing firm will or ultimately the OCC will. Like you're, you, you, you made that money and you will get that money. Whereas on some of these rickshaw uh, crypto exchanges, um, there's, there's not a clearing firm. There's, there's no real integrity in that system and you might buy a whole bunch of calls and make a couple hundred thousand dollars but then the other guy on the other side is you know some 17 year old kid in his basement uh in his mom's basement who like has 26 dollars in his bank account and he says oh you know uh <laughs> i am closing my account and where do you get your money you don't get it from anywhere so you have to be really sure that Either there's some sort of clearing firm 
or there's something built in the blockchain that guarantees that you actually get that, you know, get your profits. Yeah, it's an important thing. Thankfully, a lot of the options here in the U.S. are working around that. CME obviously has built-in clearing, so you don't have to worry about the clearing aspect there. And Ledger X and a lot of these other ventures are starting to do more of the fully collateralized type options. So if you're going to do these trades, you have to put the collateral in kind of up front. So that does kind of mitigate some of the counterparty issues there. And they are making advances on clearing. But I hear what you're saying, Dan. It still is few and far between from here in the U.S. where we can look at OCC backstopping all of our trades. And it's kind of just a done deal that you know. You buy or sell an option, you know the other side will be there for you at expiration. Still not entirely the case in the land of crypto. All right, next up, John Henry, a man of myth and legend, writing into us, Dan. John Henry says, hey, guys, I love your show. So much. (laughs) And because of your education, I have realized my mistake. Okay. I am new to options and I am playing around with spy options. I think I got a little greedy because I bought a put credit spread, the 423, 424 put credit spread in spy. How do you buy a credit spread? Well, we'll get to that in a second. Spy closed today at 417.59. I believe the expiration for my contracts is May 14th. 17 days from when he sent this email in. What would you recommend I do? Also, I was, (laughs) I'll just say, not a a smart person. I'll use a more family-friendly term. I was not a smart person, and I bought 16 contracts. Should I buy a call credit spread on it to limit the downside? All right, I'm, I'm confused by his question here, Dan. A lot of things are, the terminology is kind of flying fast and furious here. First off, he says he bought a put credit spread. Now, we talked very recently on the show about credit spreads versus debit spreads. This is a very basic definition. A credit, you're collecting a credit. So it's very difficult to buy unless you're talking a ratio, which can happen, but you don't specifically say that. So when you say you did the 424, 423 put credit spread, I'm going to assume you sold that. Now, of course, as you mentioned, those are in the money, and he wants to buy a call credit spread against it to limit the downside here. I don't, I'm I'm confused by his confusion. <laughs> Can you make sense of what John Henry's getting at here? Uh, well, one, th- yeah. If if I'm inferring the same thing as you, where he actually sold it and now it's in the money and it's against him. I would say it would be a terrible idea to do a call credit spread to limit downside. Like I, I think um, like you're kind of mentioning here, at least implying that you're, Oh, you're saying you're new to options. So never trade anything more complex than you feel extremely confident in like, and, and, you know, just kind of using some, you know, wrong words in the question makes me think maybe, maybe you could be paper trading this first. You know, you might be a little, I think they say over your skis. I'm not a really great skier, so I don't really know what that means, but I I, I think I understand when people use it that way. Um, So yeah, I think maybe this is already a little more complicated of a trade than maybe you're ready for. I, I could be wrong. But, but I, I kind of infer that and turning it into an even more complicated trade, that's just a terrible idea. So don't do that. There's nothing wrong with taking a loss. Like, I mean, geez Louise, I mean, some traders, most of the trades are losses, but they're so good at managing risk that they crank out money in the long run. So if a trade goes against you, don't be afraid to just take your lumps and move on to a, another better one and make it back. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say here. It's, it sounds like you sold this put spread, despite what you said. It sounds like you sold this put spread, and it's, it's many handles against you. First off, that's a very tight put spread to be selling there, and now it's against you. I agree with Dan. Do not buy a call spread. Do not do anything else on this. I think you probably should just take it off. Take your lumps, like Dan said. The sooner, the better. And then I think that's a good suggestion. Paper trade a little bit. Get a little bit more familiar. Maybe you start with some more, even more basic strategies in a paper trading account. You look at covered calls in spy and then maybe you look at using uh, let's talk about the wheel you know using a simple cash secured put position on a strike you've identified you don't mind buying sell a put there and then if it gets down to that level you get the spy it turns around and now 
You can sell a covered call against it. You can wheel in. You can wheel out. Maybe you pick a different underlying if you're more comfortable with those. One that maybe doesn't swing as much. <laughs> maybe we go to a Ford, a nice $12 stock, something like that. Start a little bit slower. Don't be afraid to paper trade and definitely close this one out before it, it gets even worse. These stories of adding legs onto trades that are already broken and against you, that's where things really get crazy and get hairy. And You don't want to go down that road. Uh, good luck to you, John. If you have more details you can provide to us, uh, let us know. And also let us know what you end up doing because we we want to make sure you guys are, are doing well out there. If you have to take some lumps early on while you're still learning, you're, you just admit it, you're still learning. So maybe that's why you kind of swore at yourself for buying 16 contracts. Maybe you do a one lot next time, right? Keep it simple. Keep it small. Keep it simple until you get to borrow Dan's metaphor there until you get your skis under you. All right, next up, Bill, Bill Roberts. Hi, guys. Thanks for the show. Well, you're welcome, Bill. Thanks for writing it. It has helped me a lot. Question. If there is generally more premium in the put wing of an option, what would be the rationale of executing a buy right instead of a cash covered put? A couple of terminology things first. A buy right, if you're not familiar with listeners, it's just another term for a covered call. Effectively means you're buying the stock and writing a call against it. It was a trade that was done as a package a lot back in the day on the trading floor, so it got to be called the buy right. In fact, you very rarely had a broker come in and say, how's the covered call? And it would always be, what is you know this stock, this strike, what's the buy right? That's kind of how they termed it. So that's the more professional term for a covered call, but it's the same thing. So we all know if you're listening to this show, covered call, short put, synthetically the same from a risk perspective. So as Bill points out, there is more premium in the put wing. So why would you sell a put versus the call? You're going to get more premium if you do on the put. But then think about it in a couple of different ways. First off, covered calls, <laughs> those have been outperforming of late. Why is that? Because typically covered calls, you're getting less premium for it. But typically covered calls are done in a out-of-the-money strike, right? And so you have a strike where, let's say you sell. I mean, people are selling small delta calls these days. They want to get a lot of premium, let the underlying run. If you sell a small delta call, you're not making much on the covered call portion, but the appreciation portion of the stock is where you tend to outperform. In fact, we just had Matt from ORATS on our advisor's option program earlier today. He broke down some great back testing and really broke down what are the ideal terms and everything else you need to consider specifically for this when you're writing covered calls. So if you're listening to this show, listeners, I encourage you, check out our advisor's option program, the most recent one. It's all about covered calls. And we have a great breakdown of why you should and how you should be using covered calls. So that's one way out covered calls are outperforming right now. And certainly if you're in an underlying X and you're looking at selling the put versus having the underlying and selling the covered call, you can get more appreciation on that covered call side. The short put, all you're ever going to get is that that amount of premium you collected, and that's it. So that's why some people like to migrate their covered calls actually to in-the-money covered calls. They don't, they're not as concerned about upside, and they want to get a little bit more of that extra juice. They're more about the income. And so they don't mind giving up the upside if they're getting extra juice for it every month or every week, whatever they're doing for it. So they do it exactly for the reason you described. But most people have the stock because they want it to rally, and then they use the covered calls as an extra income component. So when you factor in the appreciation, that's why the buy right tends to outperform, at least is right now. If you have a different market and the market start falling out of bed, a little bit of a different story. You don't have that component. Then you then it's a little bit of a different conversation. Dan, what do you have to say for Bill? Wants to know, you know, puts are usually more juicy. Why would I ever do a covered call? Yeah, um, basically, I'll, I'll highlight some of the things you said. Maybe try and uh, add, add a little bit new stuff if I can. But keep, you know, keep in mind this one thing. And that is that calls and puts are synthetically related, right? So a covered call and a cash secured put or a buy right and cash covered put as you, as you put it here, like they are pretty much identical, meaning they should have pretty much the same risk reward if they are the same strike price, right? And, and like, that's just the part that I really wanted to, reiterate and kind of hammer home just to be safe like if we're talking about the same strike price now typically when we think of of these two things we think of just different animals because we're always thinking of the out of the money it's like mark was talking about um and so so yeah i mean if you're 
if if you're looking at the like if the stock is at 100 and you're looking at the 95 strike cash gear put or the 95 strike buy right hey man it's kind of the same thing there are some subtle small differences when we're talking about about synthetics one is early exercise possibility right because one of those is going to be in the money uh, and so you just want to know when you're going to get exercised or, or well, when you're going to get assigned, rather. Um, and then just some valuation related to interest in American exercise style. But um, but, yeah, I think you keep that stuff in mind. Keep in mind the other stuff Mark said and, and you'll be all good, my man. Yeah, this gets back to what we're talking about, the credit and, and debit spreads again. It gets down to the practical versus the theoretical. You know, you and I. We're talking about the theoretical way that it works, which is effectively like a box, the same strikes. The listeners are writing in more from a practical perspective, which is how they view credit and debit spread, which is typically out of the money. And that's the way I was answering it. From a practical perspective, people are doing out of the money strikes on the covered calls and out of the money strikes on their short put. You're right, Dan. Theoretically, when we say risk equivalent, it is on the same strike. But that means if you're looking at a 5% out of the money put strike to sell, you also have to sell the same strike on the call side in order to get that put premium. And that means you're clipping all of your upside. So practically, I mentioned a few people like to do in the money covered calls, but they're a relatively small minority. Most people still are in the game for some of the appreciation. So, and it also has, you know, there's a couple other reasons. There's less legs to just sell the put versus having the stock and selling the call. There's a lot of other things that go on with the covered call that make it a little bit more complicated. But in general, people are looking at out of the money covered calls versus out of the money Short puts, and in those scenarios over time, often people say, oh, I wish I hadn't sold the put. wish I had bought the stock instead whenever it pops, right? And so, all right, next up, Alexander. I like the way he does this. European version of Alexander here. He says, hi, guys. Great show. So thank you, Alexander. So my question is about put. Oh, back to the credit spreads, Dan. Everyone's got credit spreads on the brain. My question is about put credit spreads. To manage the risk that the stock drops to my long strike just before expiration, I tend to prefer diagonals with the long position expiring one week later. All right, so he's selling a put credit spread, listeners, and he has the long position go beyond the shorts, expire one week later. This would generate some Vega profit in my worst case scenario. What are your thoughts on this strategy? Alexander, oh, he's from the Netherlands, Amsterdam. I think it might be the first from the Netherlands we've gotten in sometime, certainly on this show here, Dan. So good to see Folks from the Netherlands chiming in as well. Like I said, this show, a lot of international listeners out there. So if you're in the Netherlands, everything I said about crypto trading, a little bit different. You can trade on Deribit on the options. So that's a different beast, much tighter, much more liquid over there than we have here in the U.S. So feel free to go to town on your Bitcoin options there, Alexander, from uh, the Netherlands. But back to your question. So you're selling and you're selling a put closer to the money, let's say in a weekly, and you're buying a longer term one, a little bit farther out. So effectively what you're doing here, Alexander, is you're kind of financing that longer term long position with the nearer term uh, short put. That's kind of what you're working on. So I'd, I'd be curious for you, uh, the question I have for a lot of people who do diagonals then is how do you take it off? You put it on as a unit. Do you take it off as a unit once the near term put expires or do you kind of let it, like I said, use it as a financing tool to finance that longer term position and then keep that position on and see if you get what you need for that one to happen. But Dan, he has an interesting wrinkle to his. He wants to also know about just doing that from an overall Vega perspective. Obviously, he's going to spend a little more on that long leg. So he's given up on the premium side to do this. Do you think it's worth it from as he puts it? The Vega profit in his worst case scenario, does that make up for the premium he's given up? I mean, if the Vega were to give you enough profit to cover that, yeah. But, I mean, I don't know if it would for sure. Um, I mean, if the stock drops to your long strike just before expiration, I would tend to prefer diagonals with the long position expiring one week late. I mean, yeah, see, that's a thing, man. Like, I think it's something that helps, but I I feel like a better solution might just be just to keep it simpler and just, I mean, what I do, and I've had people tell me, no, no, you can't do it that way. That's like oversimplifying it. But if, if the stock goes through the short strike price, I take it off or I adjust it. 
Um, and I don't know, I feel like that works. I feel like if it goes all the way to your long strike, mm, like you're already kind of in trouble and probably, probably the whole thesis of, of your trade for why you put that trade on in the first place is probably not really valid anymore anyway. And you shouldn't be in the trade. I don't know. I, I, I'm a little bit skeptical that you'd make enough on Vega to to make up for it. Yeah, I, I don't like this. I think it's a bit of a crapshoot. He's paying more at the outset. He's getting less premium for his trade. So he's already incurring a cost for this. And the assumption with that cost is it's going to work out with this Vega boost that he's talking about. But we know the narrow term contract is going to be in his face from a short gamma perspective. The question now is, what wins, right? The short gamma we know is going to be hurting you. Does the long Vega, the extra Vega, does that kick in enough to offset the short gamma that we know is going to be biting you? Again, that's almost impossible to say. It depends on a case by case and what you're looking at. I think what Dan was saying about keeping it simple, you're going to make more premium too, just from the, if you're selling a credit spread, Part of the goal is to get the premium. So you're going to be saving yourself some money in the outset. And then also, if it does blow through your strike aggressively, you could roll it down. It is simpler to keep it in that front month and all keep it together. I have to look and see. And maybe I'll run some back tests on that for myself. And then we'll talk to Matt, who has a great back tester, and see. Because that's one I my gut tells me no that the negative gamma is going to come back to bite you. And the little bit of extra vega you're getting. It's only a weekly. You're not talking a, a ton of Vega, right? So the little bit of extra Vega you're getting, I don't think is going to be enough to save you and certainly not enough to merit the extra cost. You're paying a whole extra week's worth of premium for that. So it better work out pretty darn well. And I'm going to guess it's not. You've been doing the strategy though. I'm I'm curious from you, Alexander from the Netherlands, how has it worked out for you? This is an interesting one. I might have to go and and back test this one for myself just to see. But I, I, my gut tells me no. All right. Let's see here. Next up. Oh, Joe and Linda. Joe and Linda. The Joe and Linda duo. Says, hey, Mark, this is Joe, a.k.a. my boy Luigi. (laughs) So I noticed the app doesn't have the link for your crypto rundown show. Is it supposed to? Oh, that's not good. We'll have to make sure. We'll have to go check with our app purveyors. You know, sometimes glitches happen. Maybe they took out the crypto rundown for some reason. We will remedy that, though. So if you're using the app, listeners, and for some reason you can't see the crypto rundown, I'll have to go check after the show then uh, we'll make sure that it's in there. It should be in there. Yes, all of our content should be in there. Uh, he says, I'm all, also, I'm really looking forward to your subscription-based format. <laughs> I have a few others I use, but I have listened to your show religiously for a little over three years. I enjoy what you offer the most. Thanks so much for answering my questions when I chime in on the live show. And I can't thank you enough for what you and your show, as well as the people you have on, have taught me over the years. Thanks again. My boy, Luigi. Well, thank you very much, Luigi, and everyone else who joins us live and asks questions and rates and reviews us, uses our app. I let the cat out of the bag a little bit there, but I have been teasing it. We are looking at some interesting, fun upgrades. People have been asking us since we launched this network over 14 years ago, you know, what else can I do with you guys? What else can you offer on top of the shows and everything else? And we're coming up with some ideas for that. We got some cool ideas, actually, and they're, they're in the offing as we speak. They'll be coming pretty soon. I may, if I give you a hint... I'll say stay tuned to Option Block episode 1000, which, yes, 1000. Isn't that crazy? It's coming up pretty soon. There may be some stuff dovetailing with that. Nothing scary. No one's going to take anything away from you, but we are going to add a bunch of cool stuff, I think, going forward. For people who want a little bit extra in their lives, like the Ouija, I think we can, uh, we can do that for you. All right, let's go here. Let's go another one here. Let's end with some more love while Dan finalizes his... His love haiku. This this is another five-star review. I believe this is also from Apple Podcast. This comes from Stunt3001. His title of his review is Great Information! Exclamation point. I really enjoy listening to this as I feel like I'm always learning. Please keep it going. Side note, (laughs) you guys use great microphones. So as far as your podcasts, you're really easy to hear and listen to. Thank you. Well, I thank you. Our audio guys will certainly thank you there as well. Stunt 3001. We do put a lot of effort into trying to make the shows sound as good as possible. So glad to see you appreciate that. And glad to see they, they appreciate the information. So, Dan, what do you say about this? Another dose of love. And then, B, how's your haiku about love coming? Uh, you know, I'm going to have to. I'm going to need more time. I'm going to need an extension on the haiku assignments. Did the dog uh, eat your haiku? 
<laughs> yes. Now I got to clean up a pile of barf. All right. We'll wait with bated breath for our next show for Dan's haiku on all the travails of love. Unfortunately, listeners, that music means we've come to the end already. We got so many great questions. Got more here from all over the world. Great to see that boot camp and the network is really reaching so many people all over the planet in these crazy times. We love you all. So keep those questions. And sometimes you have interesting curveballs you throw at us, which we love. I want to go check out that, that diagonal a little bit and see exactly how that plays out across a variety of underlines because it's going to be different on each one and see maybe there's a little bit to that i don't think so but we'll never know that's why your questions are awesome and dan if folks have more questions after the show and they want to reach out to someone where should they go what should they do well you i'll tell you what you should do you should attend our market taker mentoring summer summit because that is the event of the year and you don't have to leave your house this year. It's a three day, all day live online event, June uh, 3rd, 4th and 5th. And if you just go to markettaker.com slash summit, you'll learn all about it. You'll get a really great discount. Wait, are you telling me I could attend your summit without pants for the first time ever, sir? Uh, you, you know, we're we're actually all booked up, but next year, um, <laughs> next year, next sure. year is the pants optional <laughs> version. I'll tell you, listeners, he keeps he keeps kicking me out of his sweet sweet summit. You guys can check it out for yourselves. Just because I don't want to wear pants, I don't I don't get what's wrong with them. Check it out for yourselves. Market Taker two T's in a row. MarketTaker dot com to learn more. On behalf of Mr. P and indeed myself, I want to thank all of you out there from all over the world who keep taking time to listen and download and rate and review and send questions to our show. We love you all. We'll see you back here throughout the week for all the rest of our shows we do here on the network and then back again next Education Wednesday for another Options Bootcamp. This episode is sponsored by Demand Derivatives, a startup futures exchange and clearinghouse trading the world's major assets in a creative new way. You already trade on an exchange. Here is your chance to own one. Before they approach large strategic partners for funding, the pioneering team at Demand Derivatives launched a crowdfunding portal so that regular traders have the chance to buy shares. Learn more and become a part of this revolutionary fintech project now at demandderivatives.com slash crowdfunding. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options. StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash The Options Insider, or via questions at TheOptionsInsider.com.